Hi, I'm Jacqueline. And I'm Courtney. And this is Caffeinated Crimes. So I have a funny story to tell you that I somehow <laughs> did not tell you for the last hour that we've been talking. But I was surprised that you remembered it at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remembered earlier. I was like, oh, this will be funny to tell on the pod tonight because it's like true crimey related. So I'm like, I feel mm-hmm. like our listeners would enjoy it as well. But I'm like, you can tell that my child is being raised by someone who consumes too much true crime because tonight we went to talk to target and as we were leaving there was like two ladies like leaving like right behind us and <laughs> millie just kept turning around she's like those people are following us those people are following us oh my god <laughs> and i was like andrew and i were like millie they're just they're just going to their car just like we are she's like they're still following us they're still following us <laughs> like she just kept turning around and <laughs> like oh they're still gosh. following us and like these two ladies are all like oh my god <laughs> like they were like laughing but, but... <laughs> That is also my internal monologue every time I'm leaving a store. Exactly. That person's following me. Or if someone makes like two right turns after you. You're like, they're following me. I have to take a different route to my house now. (laughs) Just like this weekend when we went to the cabin and that car was behind us for a long time. And I was like, if he turns on this road, I'm stopping in this church parking lot. And I'm I'm just sitting here. (laughs) I'm just sitting here. Yeah. (laughs) Or I'm booking it if he pulls in after me. Um, but yeah, I thought that was funny and trying to calm her fears that they are not in fact following you. They are just going to their own car, just like everyone yeah. leaving Target right now. <laughs> just like everyone else. Oh, but oh, that is quite funny. funny. Sorry, I'm now yawning. Um, well, we did ooh, wait man. till, you know, almost 10 o'clock to start recording this episode. So. I know. We. Whoops. We got really, really derailed. <laughs> um, Courtney and I spent an entire weekend in the cabin together, so clearly we didn't have enough time to talk, okay? <laughs> we still had more shit to say, like we do. Ugh, always. Like we always do. Always just talk to our talking. That's what we yes. do. Well. I also, earlier this week, thought of something else that I was going to pose, um, to our listeners and nope i think it's i think it's gone yeah i don't know where it went um it was similar to the question of like how you listen if you like have found us recently like if you start it was something along I those know. lines i know what i'm gonna ask people what because i learned something this weekend at the cabin that blew my mind about people who make peanut butter and jellies that's not what i <laughs> thought you were gonna say i also came home and said it to Kevin and he was like yeah what are you talking about so <laughs> I'm gonna have to ask my mom about like he agrees faster. with I'm us or call- he agrees with yeah you. he agrees with you okay okay I'm about to have to like call my mom and be like is this like a my mom thing okay because <laughs> we basically took stuff to make sandwiches and Jacqueline was saying at her house because I had to bring sunflower butter. I have a peanut allergy. So Jacqueline was saying at her house, anytime she makes a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, she always used two separate knives in case I'm ever there. And I was like, but wouldn't you just use two separate <laughs> knives anyway? Like one for your peanut butter, one for your jelly. And she's like, no, you just use the same one. And I was like, what? And then <laughs> Tiffany was like, yeah, like you use the same one. I'm like, <laughs> what? And then I came home and I was like, Kevin, like they said they use the same one. And he was like, yeah, I mean, I don't eat them, but that's how my parents would do it too. And I'm like, what You're like what always used to so i need to figure out if this is something like my parent i don't ever remember my parents doing that but i mean yeah maybe this stemmed from me have getting an allergy like that's true. around middle school mm-hmm. and they just started and i just don't remember it but i'm like but also you know my mom is kind of like me and gets like weird about things. And like, so is my dad where he's like very particular about things. So I'm like, mm-hmm. could this be a thing where they were like, we hate the idea of like the two mixing. And that's like where yeah. I got it from. But my mind was blown that people just use <laughs> the same knife for the peanut butter and then dip it in the jelly. I mean, like, I definitely will like scrape off like the excess yeah. peanut butter. It's not like I'm just taking like a whole wad of peanut butter and just shoving <laughs> yeah. it down in the jelly. But like, let's get a little bit in there. Like, it's all right. But like, what if you like jelly with the peanut butter? But if you're getting like a biscuit, and then, then you get a little oh. surprise bite of peanut butter. Like, are you telling me there's a problem <laughs> it's like when with you, that? It's like when you get the special noodle <laughs> like, <laughs> when you order spaghetti and you find one penny pasta in there. <laughs> exactly, I would be delighted by a surprise yeah. bite of peanut butter. I just don't want that to happen to you, which is why I That's use true. separate knives. <laughs> but yeah, so I'm just like wondering. I'm like, never, never in my life did I. Something just flew over the I camera. I saw that. I think it was over the camera, but it wasn't. <laughs> um, 
But yeah, I, my mind was blown. And so I was like, what? Yeah, yeah so I definitely Mac, need but... to know. Yeah, need to know how everyone else does that. I also just want to say, too, that I have, like, always done that for you. Even when I lived 500 miles away. Because, like, <laughs> what if you came and surprised me for a visit next week? And then you couldn't I guess the other question, does Andrew do it, too? <laughs> or have you been doing it this whole time? And Andrew hasn't, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> That's a good question. Because <laughs> I'm sure he's probably not on board. <laughs> I should probably let him know that's what we're doing. Because I thought about that too. I was like, what if Andrew's just out here doing that and doesn't even know? Oh, I mean, he did try to kill you with almond milk one time. So you know, I wouldn't true. be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I'm also very weird. I was telling Jacqueline and Tiffany this about like food, silverware things. Like, and mm-hmm. I'm putting something in the microwave and like I stir it and it's still cold. Like, I have to clean off that spoon. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know. It just like, creeps me out i don't know why <laughs> i just try to do as few dishes as possible is really my yeah. only goal <laughs> like, yeah. even though i have a dishwasher so it doesn't even really matter yeah. for silverware but you know i get it i just you know like if if the spoon doesn't get all the the stuff and then you have that one like cold bite of soup, yeah bleh, bleh. no i get it i definitely don't think it's like a weird take to have i just yeah don't do it don't do it i don't i've not really met too many people who have (laughs) so it's just (laughs) a me thing i guess but i mean kevin literally no matter what he is reheating i mean he'll do it for less time but he will not put anything in the microwave for more than two minutes so it's two minutes and he's eating it like he'll put soup in the microwave for two minutes and then he eats it like if it's a little cold oh well He's like, that's, that's the most the microwave that's... can do. So it's over after that. And you know, you yeah. Get you and get. so sometimes when I heat up our food, I'm like, stir it, put it back in there. I'm like, this <laughs> is so disgusting. <laughs> Whereas me, like if I get one little bite of like lukewarm food when it should be hot, I'm like, bleh, bleh, bleh. I can't feel You're like it. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. But <sighs> yeah, anyway. definitely let us know how you guys handle that situation for sure. Yeah. Because I just had never thought of that or maybe just forgot about that (laughs) yes we will go ahead and get into this episode because it is increasingly getting late um yes and this one is a crazy story so um our references for this episode are a new york times article a new york post article the britannica website all that's interesting and an ap news article um and i just want to go ahead and give a shout out here to azam Ahmed, I hope I pronounced your name right, Um, for the New York Times article. That is where I got like 90% of the information and it was just really well done. Um, And in true Courtney fashion, because this is the second time it's happened like in the last few months, is (laughs) right as I'm finishing up right before we record, I find out there is a book. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. So he also wrote a book called Fear is Just a Word. Wasn't able to read it, but I do want to read it soon because I assume it's going to be really good. And he spent a lot of time researching this, but he's the author of that New York Times article where most of this information came from. So in 2014, San Fernando, Mexico was kind of a bit of a grim place. Um, Many bars and restaurants closed out of fear of shootouts. Mass graves were very common. And like finding graves with like less than 20 people like rarely made headlines just because it was like so common to happen in 2010 about 72 bodies were found at a ranch so this is kind of just like what is regularly happening in this area and in the following years upwards of 200 bodies were found so los zetas i hope i'm saying that right (laughs) i've tried really hard with all these pronunciations so please My sincerest apologies for anything I fuck up because I have a Southern American tongue that doesn't like me. Um, So they were like in war with like their former boss. So basically they started as um, they're a Mexican drug cartel and they're formed in 1997. And they started as the like enforcement arm of the drug trafficking Gulf cartel. So they were kind of like a sub section of the Gulf, Gulf cartel. And around this 2014 time, they are now fighting with the Gulf cartel. So they're kind of turning against their former bosses. Um, And they did break away as an independent organized crime enterprise in 2010. And they're known to be one of the most violent cartels in Mexico. 
they would just snatch innocent people off the street for ransom to fund their war. And they would also sometimes force them to fight in the war or fight each other for entertainment. So they would kidnap these people to get money so that they could keep fighting the Gulf cartel. They would then recruit them as not really recruit them, but force them to be like soldiers in their war or, I mean, like gladiator style fight each other. Mm. So living in San Fernando came with this reality of violence and most everyone knew someone who was touched by cartel violence. Um, So San Fernando is along a principal route in Tamaulipas. I hope that's right. I listened to the video multiple times. Again, I'm so sorry. (laughs) Um, But it's also near a cluster of highways that can all lead into the United States. So it's kind of like one of those areas where it's like a lot of places like in and out that can get you to different places, including the U.S. Mm -hmm. So Miriam Elizabeth Rodriguez Martinez was born in San Fernando and had two children, Karen and Luis. So Luis was older and had moved away to escape the violence, but Karen had stayed in San Fernando and she wanted to finish up school and help run her mom's shop, Rodeo Boots. And on January 23rd, 2014, Karen was preparing to merge into traffic as two trucks pulled up on either side of her. So armed men forced their way into her car and drove off with her. So they drove her actually to the family home and Karen lived here during the week and her mom, Miriam, would go like into texas to be a nanny so like during the week she would go be a nanny in texas and then would come back like on the weekends and stay at the family home so when they got to the house like they had tied karen up they'd gagged her and then her uncle showed up to the house because he was supposed to work on the family truck he was a mechanic so the kidnappers kind of panicked and just kidnapped him as well because they were like there's a new person in this situation just take him as well Um, so Miriam sat down with one of the men later and just like begged for her daughter back. Um, he said Lozetas didn't have Karen, but he could help her find her for a fee of $2,000. And I guess he had like a little walkie talkie where he was like talking to people and she heard that his name was Sama. I don't know if that's accurate as well, but he's a shitty person. So I don't really care. (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, I don't know if we want to go pissing off the (laughs) cartel. That's true, but he he's we don't have to worry about him. We don't have to worry about him. (laughs) Yeah, I mean he's a wonderful person. (laughs) Anyway, Sema. So Miriam did pay the money to try and find her daughter. After a week, he stopped answering the phone and other people called and claimed to be the kidnappers, saying, like, we just need more money, just five hundred dollars. The family sent it anyway, even though they doubted it would bring her home. So Miriam kept sending payment and hoped, like, with everyone, she was closer to bringing Karen home. She's like, I don't care. Like, I'm going to send the money because Karen might come home. But unfortunately, she still was not home. Um, So Miriam was separated from her husband at this point and decided to move in with her older daughter, Azalea. Um, So a few weeks after the last payment, Miriam told Azalea that she had a feeling Karen was dead and not coming back. Um, She said she would not rest until the people who took, until she found the people who took Karen. And she was like, I'll hunt them down. Like she's going Liam Neeson, taken style. She's going to find who took her daughter and make them pay. So Azalea said her mother changed after that and her sadness turned more into like wanting revenge, just like anger, revenge. Um, And this wouldn't actually be the first time Miriam decided to take justice into her own hands. In 1989, she tracked down thieves who'd ransacked her husband's safe and recovered all their missing items. Wow. Yeah. And on another occasion, she'd actually intervene to ensure the safety of her daughter's husband when he was threatened by gangs. She paid a small ransom to kind of make the problem go away, and her children often teased her that she secretly wanted to be a cop, but she wasn't corrupt enough to qualify. (laughs) So (laughs) that's funny. Yeah. (laughs) So she was pretty, you know, she She was, was, uh, yeah, yeah, she was. She was like, you're you're not going to steal from me and get away from, get away with it. So Miriam's first target was Sama. Um, She knew he was involved because they ended up letting Karen's uncle go, like the uncle that was at the house. They just kind of kidnapped. They did let him go. And he confirmed that Sama was there. So Miriam became a social media sleuth. And she was like, everyone posts on Facebook. 
everybody. So I just need to wait for Sama to mess up and post something. Um, and one morning she saw that Sama had been tagged in a photo on Facebook. A young woman was standing beside him in the photo and she was wearing a work uniform of an ice cream store two hours away in Ciudad Victoria. So she's like, okay, I know where this girl works now. Let's go. So Miriam stalked the store for weeks until she knew the girl's schedule. Like she was like, I know exactly when she works all the time. And she waited each shift until she saw Sama and he did finally show up. Finally came. She followed the couple to their home and marked the address. Wrote it down. Was like, perfect. Miriam tried to give this information to the police. Again, they're corrupt, just like in the U.S. (laughs) But they said a location was not enough. For some reason, they needed like a more specific name. So Miriam dyed her hair, dressed up in a government uniform. Um, She had an old job. Like she used to be one. So she still had the work uniform dressed up in it and spent more, most of the day pretending to be doing a poll on the neighborhood and got the basic details she needed on Sema. Oh my God. Yeah. So, I mean, pulling out all the stops. Mm -hmm. Um, I love it. However, she went to local, state and federal authorities and no one would really do anything. Um, she did finally find a federal policeman who was willing to help her. He did not want his name released for obvious reasons. Um, and he said the amount of detail she'd gathered was like incredible. He was like, it was insane how much she had just gathered. And by the time the government issued an arrest warrant, Sema had already skipped town. So now Miriam decides to double her efforts and to figure out who else was involved. And she just had stacks of pictures of people posing with Sema, just like pictures of people with him that she was just trying to go through, identify who it was. And then on September 15th, 2014, Sema showed up again. So September 16th is celebrated as Mexican Independence Day. So a lot of places were gearing up for like the celebration for the next day. Like September 15th is kind of like the eve of that. Miriam's son, Luis, owned a shop in Ciudad Victoria, and he was closing up, and he noticed he had one last customer, and he was like, that's Sema, that, that's Sema, I see him in my shop. So he called his mom, let her know, and he carefully followed him, and then Sema was arrested. Um, he kicked and screamed, he claimed he had a heart condition, I guess people who have heart conditions can't be arrested, um, but once in custody, law, he, don't you know, <laughs> don't you know, you can't do it. Um, But once he was in custody, he did give up more names and locations of accomplices in Karen's disappearance. So we're not going to piss off the cartel because they're probably mad at him anyway. (laughs) (laughs) True, true. He gave all the names. Um, And one of those names was Christian Jose Zapata Gonzalez. Um, He was barely 18 when police arrested him. So Miriam was allowed to watch Christian's questioning and her heart actually went out to him a little bit because like Christian was like asking for his mom. He said he was hungry and Miriam actually gave up her own lunch to him so that he could eat. Like she had like a little bit left and like gave it to him and police were amazed. They were like, what are you doing? And, but she said, he's still a child no matter what he did. And I'm still a mother. When I heard him just now, it was like my own child. I literally just have chills everywhere right now. Yeah. And this must have softened his heart a little bit because after this, Christian told them everything that happened. Absolutely everything. Um, He even said that he would take them to the ranch where they killed multiple people and buried them. And they searched the location that Christian told them about. And in a stack of personal belongings, it was just like tossed in a pile. Miriam found Karen's scarf and a seat cushion from her truck. So forensic agents claimed that none of the bodies found there, because there was multiple bodies found, matched Karen. But Miriam, like, really fought on this. And a year later, a group of scientists found a piece of femur that matched Karen. So they did know for sure Karen had been murdered and was at this ranch that Christian told them about. So when they drove back from the ranch, Miriam passed a restaurant that her and Azalea had eaten at two days after Karen's disappearance. So a neighborhood resident she knew well was there, uh, Leva Ulisa Betancourt. Sorry, (laughs) Elvia. She was sitting by herself and she was saying she hadn't heard about Karen's disappearance, but 
I mean, at that point, it had been two days since Karen disappeared. Everyone had heard about it at this point. Um, and she kind of thought Elvia was kind of playing dumb. But now she's like, maybe she knew something. Maybe she was, you know, in on more than mm-hmm. we thought. So Miriam went back to her web sleuthing and discovered that Elvia was romantically involved with one of Karen's kidnappers. And the man was currently in prison for unrelated crimes. And this really hurt Miriam as Marion had known her since she was a child and even used to give her Karen's old clothes because she was like kind of an orphan, didn't have a lot of people for her. And so Miriam would try to help her out the best she could. And so this really hurt her because she was like, like, I used to be so kind to you and now you're holding back information from me. Yeah. So... Miriam stalked Olivia as well with the prison visiting hours. She was like, I'm going to watch until you go visit your boyfriend in prison and then we're going to get you. Elvia was eventually arrested and it was even discovered that some of her the ransom calls came from her house. So she was knew all about it, basically. So months continued to pass after this, and a lot of possible leads for Miriam on the other cul- culprits started to go cold. A few had died, a few were already in prison on other crimes, a few had tried to start new lives as taxi drivers, delivery men, or even born-again Christians like Enrique Uel Rubio Flores. Miriam decided to drive to Aldama to visit Enrique's grandmother. His grandmother said he'd always been trouble, but at least now he was going to church. So, Miriam started to attend the church services and found him. (laughs) The police came to arrest him at the chapel. And a few of the members asked Miriam for mercy, to which she responded, where was his compassion when they killed my daughter? So, what Miriam was doing just really messed up the status quo in San Fernando. Um, Her public campaign didn't just threaten the kidnappers, but the entire way that San Fernando had been operating – Um, And Miriam said, I don't care if they kill me. I died the day my daughter died. I want to end this. I'm going to take out the people who hurt my daughter and they can do whatever they want to me. Then in March of 2017, nearly two dozen prisoners escaped from prison in Ciudad Victoria, where a lot of the people who Miriam had targeted were. Um, So she asked for protection, but they would only send like random patrols by her home and her work. So she's like, I played a, a big part in all of mm-hmm. these people going to prison and now they're all out please help me and yeah they did very little to help her mm-hmm. however this did not stop miriam um so she was still tracking down a woman who had left town and was working as a live-in nanny um and she was one of miriam's last targets so miriam broke her foot actually while following her um miriam would sit in her car on the street like waiting to see this woman um she would pee in cups louise even had to sneak to the street one time to jump her car off because she had drained the battery listening to the radio like she's sitting here for a very very long time Mm -hmm. watching this woman doing some straight up pi shit yeah so police finally arrested the young woman and that's when miriam broke her foot um she had tripped as she was like running towards them and then she ended up having to wear a cast On May 10th, 2017, it was Mother's Day, and Miriam was headed home. It was pretty late, around 10, 21 p.m., um, and she was pulling up to the house that she was sharing with her husband again. Um, And it was a house that Karen had once lived in as well. So she was kind of moving slow because of this cast on her foot, and a white Nissan truck pulled up carrying men who had just escaped from prison. They fired 13 rounds, eight of which hit her, and she was found lying face down on the ground. She was six feet away from her car with her hand in her purse, which is where she kept her pistol. Miriam was taken to the hospital, but she did unfortunately pass away, and she was 57 years old. So within a few months, they arrested two people who were responsible and killed another one in a gunfight. Um, But many who ordered the hit did still remain a secret. So they didn't really know everyone that was involved, like only a few people. Mm Mm-hmm. So Luis has tried to investigate to figure it out, but he doesn't want to push too hard. He says he doesn't want to make the same mistakes his mom did, Um, but he tried to continue on her legacy and fighting for justice. Um, But unfortunately, membership did fade after her death. But in total, Miriam helped to track down all 11 of Karen's kidnappers and murderers. Which is just crazy. Like, Like, if that doesn't show, like, the love of a mother, like, I don't know what does. (laughs) Yeah. It's like like a true vigilante justice story like i should have just named this vigilante justice part whatever but like yeah it's truly her being like i'm going to find you i'm gonna you kidnap my daughter you killed my daughter 
every single one of you, your name is going to go to the police. And the fact that, like, she knew this is probably how her story would end, but she was like, mm-hmm. I'm okay with that because I want to get justice for my daughter. Like, I don't even care what happens later. Just, yeah. it's so heartbreaking. So in June of 2017, officials in the state of Veracruz made another arrest of a suspect in Karen's case. Um, They were, again, acting on information that Miriam had gathered prior to her death. Um, So there are some graphic details here, just a little warning. Um, But this woman had beaten and tortured Karen. Um, She had hung her up like a boxing bag and just punched her repeatedly. And Miriam had found this woman even after she had fled to Veracruz and became a taxi driver. Unfortunately, three years after Miriam's death, another kidnapping occurred in San Fernando that really shook the community, because this time it was a 14-year-old boy. So Luciano's grandfather, who was also named Luciano, had decided to not flee San Fernando and to stay in the place that he had grown up in. Um, He ran a trucking business and a cinder block factory, um, and his father, also named Luciano, owned a thriving construction material store. Um, So at 14 years old, Luciano helped both of them when he was not in school, um, and Luciano and his family knew, like, what had happened to Karen and everything that Miriam was doing to catch her kidnappers. Luciano and his family also knew their successful businesses made them more of a target for these kidnappings. Multiple family members had been kidnapped for ransom over the years, including his father, who was held for 33 days in 2012. So everyone in the family just tried to be very, like, aware and on edge, but the kidnappers just always knew, like, just when to attack. So they spent weeks baiting Luciano with a false Facebook account of a young girl. And in one message, the fake girl said, you're very handsome, I would love to meet you one day. And on July 8th, 2020, Luciano came to an agreement with her to meet her at the park. So Luciano was watching one of his sisters and said that he would be back soon. Um, He drove a truck the family had and the kidnappers cornered him just like they did to Karen six years earlier. And for the next few hours, Luciano's family frantically tried to search the city. After they opened his Facebook account, they realized like everything that had happened. And not long after the kidnapping, they called Luciano's father for ransom. So he did drop off the ransom at an abandoned road, but soon the kidnappers were asking for more. So for the second payment, the father, Luciano, drove two hours to drop the money off, and as he drove back, the kidnappers called and said they would return young Luciano that night. However, they did not return him, and they stopped answering the phone. So this kidnapping really stirred something in San Fernando. So people usually didn't speak out against the organized crime because obviously they don't want to make themselves a target, so they're like, we're not even going to like mm-hmm. try to get involved with that. However, the kidnapping and disappearance of a 14-year-old just changed everything and really broke that silence. Um, And Luciano's family started breaking the rules just like Miriam did. Um, They called on family and fellow citizens to march with them to demand the return of young Luciano. They organized search parties and held news conferences. In August, they went to Mexico City to pressure the government. Um, They pitched tents and stood outside despite the weather, and the pressure worked, and the government sent soldiers, police officers, and investigators to San Fernando a couple of times a week to conduct searches. However, they had no luck. Um, So they really just needed someone who would talk, similar to Christian in Karen's case. So police eventually arrested a cartel leader, but he didn't talk. Um, But also by then, the family knew, like, a few of the masterminds around the kidnapping, including members of their own family. So tracing the Facebook account led to some cousins who were in organized crime and had teamed up with the drug cartel. So the cousins disappeared, and the search for young Luciano was still turning up nothing. And the family now was just asking the government, like, for protection and security. And unfortunately, they did find Luciano's body in October in a shallow grave on the northern edge of San Fernando. Hours before his body was found, they had found one of the cousins responsible um, because he had showed up to the hospital with a gunshot wound to the leg. He was later charged with kidnapping and murder, and Miriam and Luciano are actually now buried about 100 feet from each other. Yeah, and just the Luciano case, like, knowing, like, your own family was responsible, like, your cousins, like, teamed up with the drug cartel to kidnap your 14-year-old son, like... Like, how do you do that to, like, I mean, anyone, but, like, a member of your own family? Yeah, it's just, I think it just shows, like, how it really affects everybody. Like, everybody, and it's hard to speak out against it because look at Miriam, who spoke out against it. And, of course, like, we're telling her story now, but she lost her life because she decided to fight against them. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Exactly. And in October of 2023, the AP News reported that approximately 112,000 Mexicans have forcibly disappeared and never shown up again. Um, and many think this number is a strong underestimate because, again, this is just the number that have been reported. Mm -hmm. And these are just stories of three people who have been murdered by the drug cartel. Again, a very small number of many, many, many people. Yeah, just kind of telling their stories and just like it's it's just crazy how much fear people have to live in and how if you're successful and you have a thriving business that you're just now a target because people will want you for ransom yeah it's just so like you work so hard to try to like make yourself successful and but then you're like but then i can't because then i'm more mm -hmm. of a target and just like you you literally just can't win you know it's so hard for people. It's like, this is where I grew up. This is where my family's from. Like, I'm not going to leave. Yeah, you know, this is where my home. life is. And then it's like, then you're just a target. It's, it's so, it's so hard. And yeah. And then I was looking up when I was looking up this, did you know that part of the like Mayan ruins can't be seen by tourists anymore because of drug cartel? Oh, wow. Action, basically, like, Ugh. only a part of it that some tourists can go to because I guess I don't really fully know. I'm not going to act like I'm a drug mm -hmm. cartel expert. I've, just because I just finished Ozark doesn't mean I know anything about drug cartels. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it was saying, like, it's really hurting tourism because mm -hmm. a lot of tourists now can't go to, like, somewhere that's yeah. a highly common area to go to that people go down there for um, just because it's not safe for them. Mm -hmm. Wow. This case is so sad and just those like it and yeah. Yeah, and just so many people who are just out there trying to better their lives and there's only so much you can do when you're like stuck in a place where this is just so rampant and mm -hmm. it's just like there's no end in sight, you know? Yeah. It's it's really heartbreaking and it's you know, Miriam was such a badass in everything she did. Absolutely. But then it's hard for other people to go and do that because first of all, like she gave up everything in her life, dedicating it to this. So, you know, that's kind of hard for people to do, like give up their entire livelihood to go stalk them. But also she lost her life. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. so then you're like, like even her son is like, I can't push too much because I don't want to also lose my life exactly like you saw like how that ended for her and you're like i'm not willing to mm -hmm. to do that as many people wouldn't be um yeah like how do you push yourself to put yourself in that position knowing how it's ended for others yeah yeah just heartbreaking a really sad one just researching this one yeah. just really really sad and um my heart really goes out for anyone in any area of the yeah. world who's living with violence like this. Yeah, and such a, like, widespread and unavoidable. You know what I mean? Like, you're mm -hmm. you're not in an area that you can just, like, oh, well, I'll just move three streets over where it's fine. Yeah. It's like it's not that way in a lot of places. Yeah, and sometimes even if you move somewhere else, like, you don't know that <laughs> yeah. the issues won't also be happening there and then... Very true. Well, for a little lighthearted transition before we do our awkward transition, um, as Courtney was talking, my cat just completely jumped on my computer. So that was a good time. Yeah. <laughs> it was just straight cat fur right across the just like, screen. Boom, like, just jumped from the ground, literally landed right on my keyboard. So I'm surprised he didn't push a bunch of buttons. And now he's trying to leave. Like, why did you come in here then? One second. <laughs> But yeah, so Courtney, what is your perk of the week? So my perk of the week is we kind of already discussed this as we had a little weekend away for a girls weekend. We got to go up to a cabin and just spend some time together. And, you know, me and Jacqueline and Tiffany just kind of after all the busyness of the holidays and everything like that, it was nice to just kind of get away, get to be in a hot tub, hang out, all of that. It was super fun um and that's where i discovered 
people share their knives in peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> it was a mind blowing weekend, honestly. Um, <laughs> no, but it was very fun, and um, yeah. I'm convinced there was a mouse in the cabin and a bear outside of it. Um, oh, a hundred percent. The both of those things definitely happened. There was something in the walls that we heard both nights very loudly. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and then the trash can had claw marks, like. A big, heavy duty trash can had very deep claw marks. So, uh, yeah. And like, he wanted that PB and J sandwich too. Okay. Yeah. And like, (laughs) maybe I know raccoons can do stuff, but this looked way too big for a raccoon. It was very big. I took a picture. It was big. It was very big. Yeah. Yeah. And it had a little safety lock. It did not matter. They got a hole in it. Um, <laughs> a safety lock but, that Courtney had to teach me how to use because I was like, I'm very confused. I'm reading the directions. It's not clicking. I'm very confused. <laughs> yeah, it was. It took me a second to like figure it out too. Yeah. But um, yes. So that is my perk of the week, Jacqueline. What is your perk of the week? What if my perk of the week was not that and was just a random book (laughs) well i thought about making my perk of the week something else because i was like well jacqueline's gonna say this we don't need to have the same but then i was like but then that kind of sounds like i'm being shady if i don't make it if i'm like my perk of the week is i finally know what the tea was in real housewives of salt lake city because i went to and i was screaming today at work watching it but no oh gosh (laughs) Uh, but yes, clearly my part of the week was also our fun little weekend away. Um, very nice to just relax and get to sleep in. Although I will say one day, it hasn't happened yet in the entire almost three years that my child has been alive. But one day I'm going to get to sleep in on a day that I also go to bed early because it's it's never been both. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Anytime that I'm able to like sleep in because like she's having a sleepover, like we're out of town, whatever. I'm always up super late the night before. So like, great, I get to sleep in, but also I'm still tired because I was up till 2 a.m. So one of these days, I'm going to get a babysitter and I'm going to go to bed at 10 p.m. And it's going to be glorious. (laughs) Perfect. Yes. (laughs) Um, But no, Um, just a super fun, relaxing weekend. Um, Got to sleep in. And also one of the best parts about sleeping in that I don't feel like is talked about enough is not just the actual sleeping, but like you get to wake up and you can just lay in bed for as long as you want to. (laughs) Like, I wonder what that's like. (laughs) <laughs> Corey and I can just lay there and you know talk to each other every few minutes and scroll mm-hmm. on our phones and stare at the ceiling you know I should have I should have just been like mommy mommy mama mama mom 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 you would have had to like climb all over me too and, like, treat me like a jungle gym and you yeah. know <laughs> all that good stuff yeah uh, but no, yes it was a very fun weekend and definitely good to get away and have a little little uh say one-on-one time but there's three of us to like three yeah. on three times. I don't know you know what I mean <laughs> yeah I know what you mean yeah just kind of like some quality some quality yeah. trio girl time <laughs> yes yes and we did get matching tattoos which is now the third matching tattoo that Courtney and I have <laughs> I know so. <laughs> you can't take up any more real estate on my body Jacqueline you're <laughs> you're taking up a lot of it <laughs> do you have the same number of non-matching tattoos as you have matching tattoos I think you just have I... the three others, right? Two others? Because you have this one, this one, the and this arm. One. Oh, you're right. I forgot it. My. <laughs> but of those other three, the other two are matching with somebody else. So you so I only have more of your one... own tattoos, Courtney. I know. I only have. It's because I want tattoos, but then it's like I need to like save up the money for said yeah. tattoos because the one tattoo idea I have is a big tattoo. So yeah, I need to like actually make the plan to do it. But yes, yeah. I forgot about the one on my chest. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Kev. Um, but yes, so I have the same amount of matching tattoos with Jacqueline as I have non-matching tattoos with Jacqueline. <laughs> I love it. That is, I yeah. just, it's beautiful. Um, yeah. So that was our collective perk of the week. You guys know where to find us on all the things. We are, it's in the show notes. Um, mm-hmm. We are also on patreon.com slash caffeinated crimes, where of course we have our monthly bonus episodes. We have pins and stickers and we have our discord and just all kinds of fun little, little goodies, little perks happening over there. Um, as always, let us know if there are perks that you would like to see that would keep you around entice you to join any bonus Mm -hmm. episode 
ideas you have. Um, if you guys want to hear us talk about things that aren't like just strict like true crime cases, you know, we do a little more loosey goosey stuff over on Patreon, some other, you know, Mm -hmm. true crime adjacent type things so anything that you like oh this would be really cool but it doesn't really fit with like our general you know podcast vibe come join us on patreon and let us know and we'll we'll put out whatever you want you know but then yeah, we'll do whatever yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> we will have our clothes on <laughs> other we than that our clothes on <laughs> but yeah we have like getting to know us better um just a lot of fun stuff and even like a full almost like hour and a half John Benet Ramsey episode over yeah. on Patreon. So yes, some good stuff over there. And if you wouldn't mind, just in case, check your Apple podcast, make sure you're still subscribed to us and that you're not like paused or kicked out. And if you're on there, give us five stars or subscribe if you haven't already for some reason. Um, Spotify, give us five stars. YouTube, like, comment, subscribe, but only nice comments, no mean comments. <laughs> um do all of that it would make us very very happy um but in the meantime go have a cup of coffee and don't commit a crime